You cannot be one of the big banks in the big bank, doing the big bank desks with hedges and spreads and all these various other fancy products and not expect to make money. That's the norm. So somebody's got to lose. It is a zero sum game, if you like. If I lose a thousand dollars, now somebody's not necessarily going to make a thousand dollars. That that thousand dollars might be divvied up amongst several different people, several different trades. But at the end of the day, the money is still a thousand dollars down in my account, which means that that thousand dollars up has to appear somewhere to balance the uh, to balance the book. So when you realise that the majority of the big commercials aren't necessarily day trading markets and the majority aren't classed as day traders, they're classed as statistical arbitrage traders, they're classed as hedgers, they're classed as uh, long-only sales uh, buy side or, or sell side only type business. You can recognize that being a prop trader, there's obviously a couple of very successful prop traders, but the thing is it's very much like the S&P. Why as a rule does the S&P always go up? Because they keep taking all the bad performers off the S&P, right? If you're a bad performer, you don't stay in the S&P. Your company gets taken off the S&P. It gets moved down the rankings. And some companies get put into the S&P to replace you, which is a good performer. So obviously, you've always got that rotation of good companies in and bad companies out. So therefore, you always have that upside bullishness, that upside bias still coming into the markets. So when you look at it from a day trader point of view, where you know you think about floor traders and you say, how come institutions, how come floor traders are so, so successful? The majority of floor traders weren't successful. If you classified floor traders as professionals, the majority of floor traders actually get blown out of their accounts just like retail traders did. It's just the ones that were successful stayed in the floor, you know, so you got more and more successful traders. It still meant that as you walked into the desk uh, day one, there was still a high probability that you weren't going to be there by day seven or day 20 or day 30. And it's the same with prop. Sometimes people are very good in prop and the people that are still at the desks haven't lost enough money to be booted off the desk yet. So when you look at a desk, a set of desks, there's going to be some people in that room that aren't going to be there next week because they're not very good. They're going to be booted. So this is what you're up against. And the reason why we're showing this is because for most people, they think trading is just about this or it's just about that. Whereas when you understand it properly, you realize there is a very small one percentage and you've got to fit yourself in that box. You've got to fit in that box. It's not easy to get into that box right there. So that's the challenge that you're facing every day you step into the arena of your charts, every day you step into the arena of your order flow or your time and sales, you're always needing to try and find that box narrative. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be that easy to get into that box and stay in that box. Sure, you'll have a couple of winning sessions, a couple of winning days, perhaps, but you've got to consistently, this is what they're saying, reliably beat the market. Anybody can beat the market on any one trade or any two trades, which is why I was reserving any judgment from our conversation this morning about the FTSE trader. You know, anybody can have three bad trades in a row, like the, the chap did have three bad trades in a row based on the trades that we looked at that were live. The guy was putting them out live. But we explained why we would not have had those trades and the trades that we would have had instead. And you all agreed with me that those trades were a thousand times better. So when you realize you're not alone when you have a stop out, it's nothing about you. It's just about the fact you weren't good enough or perhaps you just got unlucky. Like everything else, I can have a 20 on a, on a blackjack table against a, a, a dealer with a six. Well, I've got a massive probability of winning, haven't I? They can still draw 21. You can still draw 21 on the blackjack table. I can get unlucky on that, even though the probability is massively stacked in my favor against the dealer. So sometimes that's what happens. You get unlucky sometimes, don't you? 
and you just write it off. You say, well, that's the way it goes. That's what that's what I'm here to trade. I don't get 21s every time I get a hand, right? I don't always get 21s where I can sit back and chill out. I don't always get, sometimes when I, even when I get a 21, the dealer gets a 21. You're like, what the hell, right? So the thing we've got to remember when we're doing this is that even when we've got the right trade, it doesn't mean we're going to make money. We've got to play probabilities and we've got to be damn good at playing probabilities. Not one point probability. Not one point probability, but multiple points probability. Well, the problem you've got, I think, Warren, is that gamblers could also include like uh, poker players. You know, I don't think it's just guys that are maybe playing things, you know, that like slots and th those types of things. I think it could also include poker. I'd have to read the, the Wall Street Journal's article from 2013 to see what they classify, because that seems like a, you know, that seems like, a, you know, I mean, it doesn't say reliably beats the casino, right? Whereas when day trading, they're talking about reliably beating the markets. This just says, leave the casino a winner. And I think if that's the case, I think 13 out of 100 is probably correct. You know, 13 out of 100, you could probably say that on any one day's day trading, 13 out of 100 day traders probably beat the market as well, right? I think that would probably maybe even be a little bit higher, perhaps on any one day, I would say perhaps 20 or 30 percent of day traders leave the market that day as a winner but they don't reliably beat the market whereas this guy here this 13 out of hundreds you can walk into the casino get a thousand quid in the slots machine and you walk out and you say well i've beaten the casino that day and i think 13 out of hundreds to me actually looks too low i thought more gamblers would at least be able to make some money but they're gamblers for a reason i suppose and they give it all back don't they so I think the numbers are right. I think you just have to make sure you read the fact that this is just leaves the casino a winner, not reliably leaves the casino a winner, because that percentage would drop right down to very, very, very small numbers, if any, you know, consistently, unless you're obviously including things like poker. Interesting graphic nonetheless, isn't it? It's thought provoking, but it, it shows you the challenges I don't think any of you are under any illusion about the challenges. But the fact is, when you see those numbers, you're not going to win by trading the divergence on the MACD, are you? That's the point I'm trying to make.